Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> it's an incredible pleasure to be here. So thank Lisa, thank you, Hannah. It, it's it's just great to be part of of this of this new movement here in Israel. <clears throat> and second of all, it's it's my pleasure to speak for the first time in front of my brother from another mother, Nadav Chaim, who always thought that my study on geriatric was BS, and now he has to listen to a full lecture. For you, Nadav, will last two hours and a half. <laughs> I unfortunately have a very light short list of disclosure. I do have a disclaimer. I'm absolutely passionate about care of older patients. It started like uh, 12 years ago, maybe, when I started my PhD. I got affected by another surgeon. His name is Ricardo Dizio. And I've always thought that that was like my field. And I figure out like day by day why it was it. And the reason for that is because we are living in a situation, we're living in an era where the care of geriatric patients is absolutely crucial, not just like number wise, but even culturally. We are in a situation that because of the way we communicate among each other each day, that we cannot understand these people anymore. You see like the way that these two girls are like sitting on, the, on a bench and looking and staring at their cell phones. This is how we communicate today. And we created a huge gap towards this other person on the other bench. They're not talking among themselves. God forbid, just like turn around and talk to the old folk. And this is what we actually do in clinic. We think we know. We look at our evidence in our cell phones, but we don't turn to the person in front of us sometimes. And we don't ask them what they want, what they're looking for. We just think we knew the answer, and so we try to apply the answer to these people, but unfortunately, with very poor results. I made a vow that I will start my, every single talk that I give with these slides, because we have to understand, as surgeons, that we are absolutely failing this population. The reason for that, and this is a brilliant study from 2019 from the UK, so these are UK data, that shows you that if people are older than 80, they don't receive rectal cancer surgery. Only the 30% of them will go through surgery. And this is like epidemiology data, like flat, simple. And this discrimination is only based on age. And honestly, 80 year old is kind of like my average person in clinic right now. And if I had to say that like only one third of them will be taken care of, that's crushing. Because we don't give surgery to these people, because we don't have the given the optimal treatment, what we have is an unfavorable cancer-related survival among these patients. That's not given by comorbidities, by old age, by anything else, but the bad way we treat cancer in them. Why is it so difficult to treat cancer in older patients? Because if you have a young patient with cancer, there's like one switch. But if you have an older patient with cancer, it's a mess. You have multiple things, multiple layers coming together. So how do, how do we tackle that? One problem we have as surgeons in the surgical community is that we're still struggling defining the difference between biological age and chronological age. And it's not so hard to understand that the, gate, the great big phrase who died at 34 with ALS was way more frail than this random like Italian patient at my hospital that is still living his best life, as you can see from his outfit, right? But still, we don't know what to do with them. Older patients can be amazing. This is like great people. This is Miss Murphy. I got to like, read her story like two years ago from CNN. She's 82 and a heavy lifter. And one day, somebody like banged at her door and say, hey, come out, we need an ambulance, you have to come out, we need, we need, we have a weird job, like somebody's dying. And she's old, but she's not demented. So she didn't open the door to that one guy that was banging at them, but up to the point that the guy break into her house. And when the guy broke in, by her own like words, she started working on him with a table. <laughs> now when the police arrived, it was not Miss Murphy, in need of medical attention was the guy, the intruder. And as always, when you have a bad mistake, this, the, the same reason is that you have to, to do better homework. So you should have asked like the guy in the gym. He would have told you that she's the wrong person to mess with. Unfortunately, this is not all the patients we have. 
We don't know how to treat all the patients because there's such a variability. And it, this is our fault our, as researchers. Because what we've done for ages in medical oncology and in surgery is that we study the population that is done with fit people. Those are the ones in the trials. And then we took the results of those trials and we tried to apply to the everyday life people. And guess what? We don't have the same results. Now the other, the other big mistake we do in surgery is that, oh, the guy is old. Why do, we, why, why do we spend energy to treat somebody who's like 82? Like, he's gonna stay here with us for a few months? Wrong. If you look at historical data, and they're getting better and better, obviously, this is from 2001, you can see that people at the age of 80, if they're fit, they have more than 10 years in front of them. And even if they have comorbidities, still, it's like, more, more, more years, like four years, five years. That's a lot of time. That's way more than medical oncology provide their patients with sometimes. So what can we do? We thought, we thought, we studied, we worked together. And we decided that there must be a way to treat these patients better. Unfortunately, it's not one single element of the recipe that will make the, the, the food great. It's a series of things that we can implement, and I'll go quickly through all of them, and i tell you why they're so important to me. And we decided to put it down on a paper, and we figured that those were the steps for somebody who wants to learn how to treat their older patients better in a, substan in a substantial way. And two things I want to tell you. As you can see here, you're not working alone. Like there's this like, mantra that surgeons, they do things, and they're good at doing things, they got good hands. Yeah, that's nice, but unfortunately it doesn't change the whole thing because it's a number of people involving. And not only that, you need to measure what you do. You need to have to, you have to gather data, you have to share data and look at that constantly. So that's a manuscript we put together, please read it. Not because I wrote it, but because it's, it's generally like a good, some good stuff to start with. So I wanted to start from the beginning. I know that many of you are like geriatrician or like familiar with frailty assessment, but this is like a different view. It's frailty assessment for surgeons, so it's an easier version. The problem with frailty is that we, we, we can't compare apple and oranges. And then when, when a surgeon is asked, hey, how's this patient? There's like this thing that we call like gut feeling for some reason. And I said, yeah, I know that this patient is fit. How do you know? Like, yeah. Because I know, like, I've seen many. Eh, not enough. What happened is that instead, like, this is the pair of the people we have in front of us most of the, most of the time. And as Sandy was showing us, when we do surgery, we hit them hard. And if somebody is already in a situation that is not, like, fit, when you hit hard, you got into a complication state and you never recover from that. So, again, we don't want to talk about age anymore. We want to talk about frailty. Frailty should be the new mantra. So what is frailty assessment in surgery? When I ask Nadav, hey, do you do a frailty assessment? He tells me, what? What is that? Why we should spend time with this like, frailty? And I think because it's simple. Like, it, it, gets, it, it helps you to know your patients better. And it, it should be quick because we are busy, right? But it needs to be an evaluation that take into consideration like patient's function, patient medical condition, patient's mental health and ability and condition, but also social situation. And all of this can be done by a surgeon, and I'll show you in a 10 minute visit in the office. The problem is that because we're a surgeon, we don't know everything. So we just like put out like red flags, and then we'll ask Lisa and say, hey, I have this patient with these red flags, can you help me with them? Now, frequent assessment is nothing new. It has been there forever. It's an, billion like guidelines and literally everywhere you can find like whatever evidence you're looking for but in the reality it's no, nowhere to be found. That's a genius study. It is somebody who sat at MDTs, so multidisciplinary cancer teams, and he listened how people describing all the patients with cancer. And what they find out is that the way that people were described, the level of fitness, was absolutely generic. Hey, the old man is, is fine, he's fit, he's, he's good. No, he's like a train wreck. Like, this is like very generic thing. But based on this generic like, assumption, those are like the, the reason why to give or not to give care to these people. Can you imagine going into like MDT without an, an MRI? 
and talking about rectal cancer without that piece of information, but still you don't give nothing about like the level of fitness. And so you don't understand that a small cancer in such a frail patient can be deadly. Instead a larger cancer on somebody who looks like this, it can be taken out. This guy can do TNT and maybe a pelvic exam and he will survive. Now because of that in I think like 2017, we put together a group from the European Society of Surgical Oncology, European Society of Colorectology, the SIOG, and American College of Surgeon Commission on Cancer, and we put down this what we call like expert opinion. And what we said first is that you need to have it's a geriatric or frailty screening for every patient, number one. And number two, whoever is a frailty expert needs to sit at the MDT. Same way you have your radiologist at the MDT, same you need a geriatrician or a geriatric nurse at the MDT that can explain it to you, that can tell you, the surgeon, that this patient eh, may be not the best candidate. And why it's so important? Because it's like plan and simple. If you ask somebody, have you fallen over the last few months, and they tell you no, this is a risk of complication. If they fell twice, complication risks up to 60%. Can you imagine operating on somebody you know that is going to fail just because they fought before? And how many times you ask your patient, have you fallen in clinic? I can tell you how many times I did before studying it, zero. Even more simple things. I ask a patient to stand, to sit on a chair, stand, walk three meters and back. It's called the time up and go test. If it takes longer than 20 seconds, I know the complication rate is skyrocketing. And this can be as accurate as a geriatric comprehensive assessment. This is what we showed in many studies called pre-op. Now you will look at me and say, yeah, nice, this like walking thing and blah, blah, blah. But the vast majority of, of my patients, they come through the ER because they're old, they don't go to like do screening stuff, colonoscopy is no longer mandatory after the age of 70. So how can I assess like frailty in the ER, in my busy ER life? You can. And this is your friend. It's called the Flemish triage version of the, the triage risk screening tool. The, the most loved like, screening tool by any surgeons, and I tell you why. Because it's simple. It's four or five questions, and you can ask the patient, but if it's like peritoneal or septic and cannot be reliable, you can ask the family. Because those are just generic things. I mean, does he live with somebody? Does he have cognitive impairment? Does he have problem walking? Has he been at a hospital before? How many medication he takes? And it will show you that by using the, the, the Flemish, we call it like that, if the score is, is higher than two, then the risk of mortality is way higher. The risk of complication is way higher. Do you know what doesn't impact the risk of complication? Age. Unbelievable, right? So you have to ask people the right questions in order to understand if they're going to be winners or losers. And more, the Flemish can predict the function of recovery or length of stay. So if it's higher than two, you know that, that's, that somebody you have in front of you will stay in a hospital for a while. So you can A, prepare the patient, B, prepare the family, C, prepare the system for having somebody stay longer at the hospital. And so the Flemish, something simple, and you can do it in the emergency setting, it can help you like setting the ground with the family and expectation, which is kind of like key in my practice at least, but also it can have the entire team to work together and around these people. Now if you want to implement that, you do your frailty, and then of course we're surgeon, we like to do surgery stuff, right? And this is crucial for all the other patients, that we do it right. And I wanted to show you like two quick things. So this is something that I work with the Dutch people from the Netherlands, and, and you can find the publication that I showed you before with the consensus. So this is life expectancy, like the, the blue dot. And, and this is like, um, how do you say, the, the percentage of people who will die for a natural cause, the black. And this like dashboard was a historical data about patient having a protectomy. So you can see that patient with a protectomy had a higher chances of dying. Since we introduced MIS and ERAS, the percentage of people dying from rectal cancer who had surgery went down dramatically. 
almost close to people who did not have any cancer. So this means that with minimally invasive surgery and ERAS and everything we have learned at surgery school, we can improve life expectancy of these people up to the point that it's similar to somebody who never had surgery before. So this is how good we can be as surgeon if we think about what we do. Now I also want to tell you about like, my practice and my real life because it's, this is not just a story. We try to put it down in fact. So in the place where I was working, we took cases from 2018 and 2021. And of course, we are like geriatric minded, like to say so, so we care like about certain stuff. But we wanted to see if those patients who were given surgery, they were having good outcomes. Now what we do as surgeons sometimes, we just got stuck with like the, the usual outcome, like complication rate, length of stays, and blah, blah, blah. But we wanted to put it all together, and we call it like textbook outcomes. So we wanted to see if these older patients having surgery were able to survive, to not have complication, to not come back at the hospital, to not change their living situation, and to stay at the hospital for fewer days. So less than five for colon cancer, less than 14 days for rectal cancer. So if, if all combined, that was called a textbook outcome. And of course, like we screen for frailty, and you can see that like, depending on the, on the score, of course, you have like a different like, type of like, frailty measuring. But you can see this like fairly frail patients, like, you know, if you just imagine on planned ICU stay, so the way the anesthesia will translate somebody who's frail, will put it in the ICU after surgery, you will see that like 43% of them were deemed to go at least for a night in the ICU. So not like your like, simple young guy. And you can see that from our data, almost 70% of the patients were able to achieve the textbook outcome. So no complication, going home, staying at home, and stay at a hospital with, with a short length of stay. Now, if you wanted to know what predicts that somebody has a textbook outcome, here it is. Comorbidity, the godsend Flemish, and the ability to walk for three meters and back. So if you can measure these three things, and I guarantee to you, it takes 10 minutes in clinic. Now you can predict if your patient will be a winner or a loser. Now you cannot do that together. And that's why the first step of the implementation is called geriatric, geriatric co-management. So if you're interested in your geriatrician, you just don't want to ask him for an advice and say, hey, is this patient failure or not? You want him to come with you and work with you on those patients. And this should be your icon. His name is Armin Sharokni, one of the most brilliant person on earth. He's a geriatrician and a medical oncologist, worked at Memorial, now he has his own practice. And this is what he did. He published a simple way in which geriatrician were helping the surgical team after surgery to take care of all the patients. And so he published his data, and the guy is from Memorial. Okay? So it's not some like small rural hospital here and there with some random surgeons. And he was taking care of all these patients, all the patients that have been sent to see a geriatrician, and then he was taken on board and seeing them after surgery. So they put together this small like, group of like 1,800 patients. A thousand of them have a geriatric management, and a hundred of them just were managed by surgeon, like we all do, like usually on the floor. So overall mortality for their group, and this is Memorial again, it's 6.7% at three months. Only if you had a surgical managed group, it's 10%. If you had geriatric co-managed patient, it's 3.5%. Can you imagine? This is a cut in mortality of 57%. Have you ever had that in your practice? I mean, if they tell me something like, hey, you can like do surgery, half of them, like regardless, will survive better than what you were doing before. This is better than giving somebody like immunotherapy. It's incredible, but nobody's talking about it. You know what? Because geriatric is not very sexy, but this is how it works. Now, unfortunately, it's not just what we do during surgery and after surgery. We have to deal with bigger problem when we talk about like older patients, and it's called social frailty. And this to me, in my practice right now, it's the biggest issue. 
if you look at that work on, on textbook outcome and how we could like manage to just have somebody to go home and stay home and stay like fewer days at the hospital, the item that kicks like the bar low is the length of stay. The problem with the length of stay in Italy right now is that people don't want to come and pick him up, the grandpa from the hospital. They send him in. After three days, as you told him before in a pre-op clinic, the guy is ready to go, and they say, hey, can you stay an extra day? Can, oh, that's the weekend. Oh, I have to work. Oh, it's Christmas. Like, we have all this kind of thing. And so people tend to stay at the hospital longer. I mean, and I don't know how it is in Israel, but I'm telling you, Europe, it's, it's, it's awful. And there's like this saying in Italy, like, one day more is better than one day less. And I'm always asking, what's the fucking reference here? Like, more or less than what? But anyway. And so social frailty is something. I know that as a surgeon, that kind of like blows your mind because those are questions we don't usually ask. Like you talk to somebody, like stuff like that. You don't have to do it yourself. But you can ask like your, your nurse or like somebody who's better at communicating than we are to just do it for you. So you have an idea and you know that this person will be there with you. So I wanted to finish with like a, a, a short but like I don't know, practical run for me on, on what we do. When I see somebody in clinic, what they ask me is like, will I go back to my life? So number one, people want to know if they're gonna die under surgery, but second of all, they wanted to know if they're gonna be independent. So over the last few years, and that's why I met Lisa, we run this study that is called the Go Safe. We put together a thousand people from 26 Center, Robin included, and the primary goal of this study was to take every patient who was undergoing major cancer surgery and to measure for the first time at, as a practical outcome their quality of life after surgery. And secondary outcome to measure the functional recovery. Because we wanted to know if by treating cancer we're harming people or not. Now functional recovery is pretty simple. When I think of functional recovery, I think of Franco Baresi. He was like one of the best soccer players in the history of Italy. And he was like so great that in 1994 at the World Cup, he got an injury on his knee during the rounds and he had surgery and he was so quick at recovering that he managed to play on the final against Brazil. Now Italy lost like that game, but he became the, the icon for functional recovery and being able to be active again. Up until I met my patient, she was 75, 75. she had a left colectomy and 13 days after a left colectomy, she went for a 50K cycling. So that's somebody who recovered. That's somebody who's independent. And I don't care if she stayed at a hospital three, two, one and a half day. That doesn't matter. That's functional recovery. The problem with surgery is that we don't understand functional recovery just well. For ages, we have been confused by ERA's goal. That <laughs> Longer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and we think that like functional recovery means length of stay. Oh, if they stay like fewer days, it means they recovery. Not exactly right. If you, if you think of like as a surgery, functional recovery has to deal with urinary sexual function, with fecal incontinence. Has to deal with the fact that we do a loop ileostomy that will never close. Has to deal with these patients being able to be active and independent in their daily life. So the way we measure those outcomes was with a very simple quality of life score. Again, it takes five seconds at the hospital, at the clinic, to be filled by the patient. And then we kind of measure these three tests as a proxy for functional recovery. So this is ADL, so your ability to do like daily stuff. It's a time up and go that I told you, the patient is able to walk three meters. And then we did the mini cog because you wanted to know also about cognition. And this is a study that has been finally published after like a long like struggle. Uh, and I'll also tell you why. And these are the data. So this is a thousand patients, and as you can see, like it's fairly balanced in uh, in terms of ages. And then you look at stuff like I, I just like give you like an insight of my brain. So you see, like somebody's like home independent, like fifty one percent. Somebody's home with family and caregivers, forty six percent. This guy here who's home independent, he's frail. That's a frail patient because if they have a complication, they have nowhere to go. There's nobody to take care of him. Those are the ones that scares me. Now we need, we deal with like screening tools and of course that was a study so we did too much. 
but you can see that like the, the results about like who's free, who's not is all over the place. And this is like the results that I wanted to show. So one quick thing, surgeons, we, we used to think about mortality and mobility. Those are very important outcomes, don't get me wrong. But when your mortality rate is 2.9%, it's very little you can do to lower this number. I mean, there's not a lot of intervention that you can do. Now, if this number is 29%, then I will ask you like to sit and think and just like ponder. But like, when you have this number, what, what can we do better than that? I mean, it, it becomes tricky. What we can do better is look at quality of life. And this is what we did. And you can see that after surgery, quality of life take a dip in several of the domain, like mobility, safe care, ability to perform like usual activity. It improves dramatically, immediately, in pain and anxiety. And if we combine all together in something that is called an index, that's basically an algorithm that like gives you like an overall impression of what you're doing, you will see that the quality of life at three months were the same. So when a patient comes to you and tell you, am I going to be the same again? I can tell you now, based on this data, yes, at three months, you're probably going to experience the same quality of life you have now. If your Flemish rescore is not skyrocketing, because that's like a, a predictor for bad outcomes, if you don't have a history of previous delirium, another thing we never ask in clinic, and if you don't have a complication. We also look into our colorectal group, so these studies are on this, they are under review, so be kind. And you can see that almost 70% of patients experience like an equal or better quality of life at three and six months. You can see that the increase at six months is very slim. So three months is really our point in order to measure if things are going right or wrong. And again, stuff like improve better immediately. Now if you look at all the variables, again, you can see that the one that impact the most on functional recovery could be like the GA, that's another like frailty screening, the Flemish, and if they had complication. And that's the same for colon or rectal cancer. Now, functional recovery. 78% of our patient with colon cancer recovers at three months. 7% with rectal cancer, they do the same at three months. And of course, rectal cancer is more cumbersome. Sometimes you have an ileostomy, sometimes you have to deal with, with the permanent cost. I mean, so there is stuff that can impact. But again, what impact is not age, what impact is frailty the charts of comorbidity, the ECOG, having a complication. So people tell me, hey, why do you put complication there as a risk for frailty like, decline? And I'm like, well, one, because it is. And of course, you cannot predict complication completely, but you know your historical data about the complication in your institution. So you know that you are like, putting somebody through a Whipple, you know the complication rate is high, so you know that this is what you should expect. If you have to do a coloanal on somebody who's like 87 with comorbidity and a lupuleostomy, I will probably advise you not to do it. Just give it a permanent colostomy, it's safer. You cut on complication, which means that you increase in functional recovery. Make sense? So what is this? what's the secret ingredient for having somebody happy? Geographical management, maybe frailty screening, maybe prehabilitation, maybe the ERAS, maybe to a minimal invasive surgery, I think it's all of it. I think it's not just one ingredient, I think that it's a consequence of this sixth step that will really change your game. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have, it was a great talk. Um, uh, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Hi, my name is Yotam from the Tel Aviv Medical Center, and I'm an anesthesiologist. And I might follow anesthesia. One slide on the surgery. Um, do you do you incorporate the anesthetist in the prehabilitation, or preparing the frail elderly patient for the surgery, pre-op, in-op, and post-op? Yeah. So first of all, I really want to like thank you for being here. Because like for us, it's always very difficult to engage anesthesia in these talks for some reason. And, uh, and you're right, like in my, in my diagram, anesthesia is not like one of the pivotal like, person, but that's my personal bias because our anesthesiologists don't want to get involved into that. 
And instead, for example, like the vast majority of, of people like dealing with prehabilitations are anesthesiologists. Usually the leader of prehabilitation is an anesthesiologist. At my place, it is so hard to make it even do something that is not the uh, ASA score that I had to like <laughs> just like you know put them in it because they're crucial for ERAS, for example. But I wish we could incorporate anesthesia way more because we need way more. And, and I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you can maybe go home and, and tell more people that you should be not just partner, but you should be leader in that. Absolutely. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, great talk again. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm Barack. I'm also from Tel Aviv Medical Center. I'm kind of his boss. I'm also an anesthesiologist. Good. He's being very modest. Um, I wanted to make this comment on this talk and also on the previous talk. It's a little weird for me because some of the issues that were raised are not just specifically relevant for older patients. They're, they're, you know, many of these patients could be 55 or 60, or, and anesthesiologists see them all the time, and they see them quite early. And we are getting very uh, involved, at least in our center. Uh, Yotam will present his data soon, but he has like, he just published 2,000 patients' data on um, Preoperative cognitive decline, and we're doing we're screening patients all the time, on um, on a regular basis, on a clinical routine. So I'm a little uh, surprised, and I want to say that at least here, anesthesiologists are very much involved, not just in older patients, but also in younger patients who have to get ready to surgery. Uh, and there are many aspects that we can uh, contribute in, and that's why we are uh, actually very active. So I'm really uh, yeah. sorry to hear that uh, this is not your experience. No, you know what we're doing? We're, we're changing. We're we're changing information after that, and we'll start inviting you guys at, at meetings. No, because it's true. Like Sio, like you should be in Sio, because like you know we need this kind of voice. And I'm glad that you are here, and I'm glad that that, that I now know that there are more people that are interested, and that's why like it's worth traveling sometimes because we get to know others. And, uh, and absolutely, let's change, let's change info like after that. Hi, my name is uh, Eli Mizrahi. I should admit that I'm not an astrologist or a surgeon. I'm just a geriatrician more than 37 years. First of all, this is a brilliant lecture. Very simple and brilliant, but because you actually showed us that by giving some very simple tools to the surgeons or to the astrologists, you can improve very, uh, you can improve the outcomes of your patients. Okay, this is the first thing that I would like to say. Second thing that I would like to uh, uh, say that uh, most of the geriatric patients will not show geriatric, geriatrician, but most of the medical doctors will show geriatric patients. So as a result, we should give them some equipments of, from the geriatric medicine fields in order to evaluate their patients in order to get such a wonderful uh, outcome that you, as you showed us. Yes, thank you. Thank you for this comment, it's very important. Uh, I, I want to tell you one thing, like there's like this thing in like in, in Italy, in Europe, United States for sure. Um, so they, they say there's not enough geriatricians. So that's why like, you know, internal medicine people are seeing geriatric patients, like surgeons are seeing geriatric patients. And so, so, and so they tell you like, you should be able to incorporate some of the geriatric specific like skills into your practice, which is fine. I mean, I love to do like, you know, my Flemish or stuff like that, that they help me. But I must say the most disruptive change in my practice, it was when we invited the geriatrician at the MDT. Because believe it or not, you guys have a different perspective of the same human element we see. We see a guy, 98% of us see a cancer. You guys see the same person and see like, fail these in the family, see the, the social environment. So it's true, we need to know more about whatever you do, the skills you have, but trust me, we need you more. Thank you very much.